Hello, everyone. Welcome to week seven. Um, we're going to go over a very specific example of media representation that has to do with this idea of colorism and whiteness um, as not so much as represented in, in the media, on the media, as mediated uh, by media representations. And in a second, I'm going to explain what is the difference between media representations and mediated representations as in media representations. Um, so the idea of, of media representations versus mediated representation has to do with, with trying to um, unpack what happens um, beyond what meets the eye when we see certain images uh, on the media. Uh, of um, especially when it comes to racialized um, individuals and, and and especially racialized collectives, right? Because the tendency is to think in terms of stereotypes, in terms of is it conforming to the norm or non-conforming to the to the norm, and and that um, kind of stops the discussion. On its track, in the sense that it tends to be, is the type of representation that tends to be obvious. And what's more interesting and, um, and more pervasive when it comes to media representations is these mediated spaces in which media representations of racialized others, uh, and in this case, of what I will call colorism, uh, take takes place. In these mediated representations, are portrayal of collectives and the ideas these collectives um, um, embody, the idea that these collectives embody through the representations of individuals in the, in the media. So these individuals are portrayed implicitly as collectives and, and the collectives embodying, and embodying here is a key word, embodying certain ideas. And this is mediated representation through a media representation or through a media image, right? And the 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 the, the key point in mediated representations is that they create these mediated spaces that are established in structures of power, uh, and these structures of power has to do with the architecture of any uh, any any given status quo, and these structures of power in which mediated representation or mediated spaces take place, they are there to maintain and reinforce governmental hierarchies. And the maintenance and reinforcements, reinforcement of governmental hierarchies are then, are then or take place in a natural manner. And the media, and that's why these mediated spaces, as we will see in a second, are more interesting that um, racialized media representations because racialized media representations are so to speak on the nose or uh, and and when and when that happens uh, is much easier to treat them as exceptions as opposed to looking at mediated representations as taking place as part of what is called a naturalized racial and color um, uh, landscape Right? And now we're going to distinguish the idea between race and color because that's really important. And that's with, uh, and then on a, on, on, a, on a related note, the idea of colorism and no racism, and this is, uh, and this is important because th those two things go together. Um, but they go together, but they're not the same. And then focusing on colorism, because the colorism is relationship between skin color and race, really allow us to look at systemic discrimination via this mediated representation, via these representations uh, in which the, 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 representation, the representation of racialized collectives take place uh, without, with, without, an ex, without explicit imaging or visualizing of these collectives. Uh, they take place in a space that is not signal as a racialized other. Uh, colorism allows us to enter these more implicit mediator spaces and 
and allows us to go beyond the specificity of racism. Uh, because colorism takes place in terms of, because colorism takes place in terms of color or race, we can see how the perception of a skin color takes place at different transnational level, and we can understand the similarities when it comes to that, uh, the, 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 when it comes to that mediated representation. As opposed to um, when looking at racism, we need to look at the specific historical um, uh, evolution of systemic racism as a political and economic structure in that locality. And as a product of a particular very particular colonial or imperial historiography. historiography. Um, so the, 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 I've, I've chosen colorism because it's, a, it's an entry point to look at uh, media representation from a transnational point of view. And I think an example, a very, um, a, a, a very telling example is how, for instance, race and color work um, in Latin America, because race and color uh, and and how, for instance, understanding, uh, looking at racism, just racism as the 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 political and economic structure that discriminates and creates racial inequality, uh, it 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 would put us in a in a in a historical corner from which having a transnational perspective will be detrimental. As opposed to looking at the relationship between race and color, we can use Latin America as a, we can sort of like zoom out and use the relationship between race and color to realize how race and color works transnational, how it, transnationally, how, how it works throughout Latin America, the different nations in Latin America, because it works in similar ways, uh, despite the very, um, that some of the particularities, but it works in very similar ways. And also it will allow us to come back to Australia and look at those uh, similarities and differences. But if we were looking at racism as a, as a, as, as a structural racism, it, it would force us to look at the specific history of nations uh, and a, a very, a very odd, very obvious example is if you if you look at the the differences in terms of uh, racial uh, structures in Argentina versus Bolivia or Brazil, uh, you would have to really get into the nitty gritty of these specific histories. As same comes with Australia, as opposed to looking at color and race, allows us to to get into this idea of how is it race visualized, i.e. how is a color perceived and what is the relationship with certain racial discriminations when it comes to this mediated representation, these spaces uh, in which uh, images of others are visualized, right? So then let's, let's look at this idea of race and color in Latin America precisely because it's very telling and it's really interesting. Um, in the sense that it's interesting because it tends to be to to, de to defer uh, from the the overlapping that comes with race and color, and in Latin America, race and color are in an in a in a continuum. That's it. There's a spectrum of race and color, and that has to do precisely because the history of of colonial conquest and intervention in Latin America. And the the um, the structures in Latin America, the racial structures in Latin America, were based on castas. And here, castas, you have them in here, right? And these castas, uh, and had had a, a an internal um, mobility to them when it uh, when it came to uh, to in, interracial marriages, which were very common. 
uh, for multiple historical reasons, which I really don't have time to get into. But because one could very easily go from being at the bottom here, if we, one were an African slave through intermarriage to go into a mulatto, right? Uh, it could just jump cast us very quickly. Because of that, uh, what was key to understand racial discrimination was not only the historical particularity of, of economic and political racism, but the perception, the perception of skin color. And then fast forward to independence and this idea of mestizaje. Mestizaje just means mix of mixed race, but uh, it, it was a casta in and of itself in a time of the, of the conquest. Uh, was then later adopted as a matter of national policy in many Latin American countries. The idea that all these Latin American, Latin American countries were mixed of race. And this was an assimilationist policy that was meant to differentiate Latin American countries from racist, uh, from the racist, from the racist US, right? So it was basically saying Latin America, look, we're not racist, we're all mestizos, we don't really um, have um, uh, problems with race, we're all being assimilated into this mestizo race. And, and that's why, that's one of the reasons why uh, they said you have the one drop rule uh, was never consul consolidated in Latin America. So if you wanna know more about the difference between skin color uh, and race, go to Dixon and Tell's uh, very useful um, essay that explains all this difference and gets into the nitty gritty. But the important things is that, 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 that to, to just really recap and sum up um, is that looking at color and the relationship and colorism and, and the different prejudices and discriminations and and otherization that comes with the perception of skin color as related to race allow us to get uh, to get into a transnational perspective of how these others are mediated in the media, right? How they're represented in these mediated spaces. And then get this transnational perspective, we're gonna start from Latin America and then when I come back to Australia, right? So if we get into the 19th century, when all the Latin, we fast forward to Latin, that from the conquest, time of the conquest in the 16th century to the 19th century, when most Latin American uh, nations get their independence from Spain, then we start seeing this idea of mestizaje and the mixed race of Latin America as the base for the political unification of all Latin American nations in this, uh, this Pan-Americanism. Pan uh, uh, looking at all the commonalities that all these different Latin American nations had against the, the empire, the Spanish empire, and, and, but also against the indigenous population in Latin America. So the Pan-Americanismo as a political movement, the union of all different Latin American nations in a political unity, had a racial, um, a racial um, undertone to it, which was the, um, the forgetting of indigeneity, or in other words, the assimilation of indigeneity uh, into the mestizo, um, the, the mestizo vision of uh, a uni unified Latin America. And then indigenous people, when the creation of the, when these different nation states that were politically unified in this idea of Pan-Americanism, remember this is basically a movement uh, by two of the, you know, uh, of the biggest figures of Latin American independence, Simon Bolivar and Jose Martí, and other intellectuals and political leaders of the 19th century. It's a political movement that has a lot of sway within different nation states. Then later in the 
half of the, especially the se after Second World War, kind of loses uh, steam. But it's always there in the kind of in the in in the political culture of of all nation states in Latin America. It's always been there, and it's, it's still there to a certain extent. So the 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 main issue that this idea of mestizaje and panicanismo has is that it forces assimilation onto indigenous people because all of a sudden um, indigenous people are to forget their indigenous root because they we all have been touched and this we in quotation mark by the conquest so in that sense it's not so much that we all are indigenous but in in, in but more importantly it simplicity stated that we all we all are someone white, and when I mean white, as I will explain in a second, I mean uh, uh, part of the conquerors. We are part of the conquistadors. We are part of the of those with the hegemony, and 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 in that sense, it doesn't make any sense to it doesn't make any sense for indigenous people uh, to um, uphill their indigenous roots or indigenous customs, right? In the name of the nation, of the of, of a nation, of a of a harmonious nation, right? A very good example of this is if in the 20th first in the the early uh, decades of the 20th century, so Jose Vasconcelos, uh, after the Mexican Revolution, Jose Vasconcelos idea of la raza cosmica, the cosmic race, uh, which really took root all over beyond Mexico and all over, uh, all over uh, Latin America, which is, again, is that idea. It's an, an, another Pan-American trope that uh, we are all mestizos. We are all mixed race and holding to any type of indigeneity. And this was never explicitly said. It was never explicitly stated, the force assimilation. And that's, this is the key of this mediated representation. It's always implicitly understood by forcefully stating the case for mestizaje. Uh, so by forcefully stating, stating the case for mestizaje, you are, you, you are forcefully stating, uh, uh, forcefully but implicitly stating the case for the abandonment of indigenous representation and especially indigenous self-representation, right? Now, however, uh, in, the, in the late 20th century um, through different, uh, cultural currents, the, the Messi-Sahi ideology has been challenged uh, across the Latin American continent. I would say across the, the American continent because many of the nat na Native Americans from the US are holding hands intellectually with uh, the indigenous peoples of Latin America, looking at their commonalities when it comes to indigenous roots in the American continent. And they're creating in many ways, a new pan-indigenous um, identity. Uh, and then that's, that's how you can have these international days of indigenous peoples uh, that take place not all over the American continent, uh, in Canada, the US, and all the nation states in Latin America, right? And, and this idea of mestizaje comes from a, a very 19th century uh, positives, positivist um, categorization of race as a biological typology, as opposed to race being what uh, what we know it is today uh, a, as a social construct. Um, so, uh, so it, in here maybe just just as a uh, as an aside, think that the fact that race is a social con construct, it doesn't mean that anyone can identify racially as they want. Uh, it has nothing to do with the pigmentation of your skin not being, being constructed or not being real, being imagined. The pigmentation of your skin, it's a biological fact. What is not a bi biological fact is the label that different societies, nations, political movements uh, attach, the different labels and hierarchies that you attach to that pigmentations. It, I think a good example is to imagine societies were formed around, around height, short and tall. So that would have, uh, it, you wouldn't question that, that tall are, 
are sure are not biological fact. What you would question is that the labeling of people, or tall people or short people, if our societies were constructed, all our societies were constructed through that filter of, of height is a social and a political contract. So the same comes with, with race. So the, the point of race as a biological topology has to do with the labeling of phenotypes of biological characteristics to uh, certain attitudes, to, to, to social and moral characteristics, right? So um, in, in that sense, the problem that we have uh, with race and racial theory is that there is underlying morality that anything that, um, is that it steps out and that is um, labeled as, as non-hegemonic, as not part of the, of, of the, of the non-racialized structure is bad for the national body, or at least is diverging of the heart of, of for creating harmony in the national body. That's the underlying assumption. Now, indigenous self-representation will challenge that structure of mediated representation. Because again, remember, mediated representation in here is implicit in the sense that it's that it's taking the hegemonic and not the non-hegemonic, the division between those racial identities as for granted, as if that division was natural. And it never really, or it rarely uh, accuses, or at least at, at, its, at its most effective, it doesn't explicitly, in, I'm talking about obviously in, in contemporary societies, not back in the day, it never to be at, at its most effective, it never accuses, uh, non uh, uh, racialized others uh, of being inferior to uh, to to non racialized uh, hegemonic identities. It never accuses them directly, but it forceful forcefully differentiate them. It it labels them as others, as not part of the hegemonic identity which is much more effective in creating a hierarchy. Yeah. And this is done, these hierarchies in mediated representation that are again, implicit as opposed to explicit. And, uh, and the difference, and, and, I think I need to, I wanna emphasize this because it's, it's quite important to understand it, is the difference between mediated representation and media representations of, race, of, of racialized, uh, persons is that in mediated representation, the, the focus is on the implicit division between, let's use this term, uh, white and non-white. The implicit division between white and non-white. Uh, and that implicit division, because whiteness is hegemonically constructed, creates an implicit hierarchy as opposed to media, media representation or simple, simply media representation of racialized others when, uh, when done from a top-down perspective is stating the case of, uh, of another, simply putting in there an other as in, other as in someone. And it can be taken as an exception. The, the explicit media representation of a racialized other could be simply understood and that's just simply an exception of how the national body works, yeah? Now, with indigenous self-representation, these structures, these dichotomies are challenged, and especially in interest in how the mediated representations of, of racialized persons take place. And this, um, and, and it's important to understand this idea of the white gaze. And, gaze. and I, I'm gonna get in a second into the construction of whiteness, but um, to advance just uh, a little bit of the idea of what I mean by whiteness, really I'm talking about hegemonic identities. Um, that, and we use hegemonic identities because historically and pervas pervasively, um, 
the construction of whiteness is the construction of a hegemonic identity. So think about this idea of the decolonization of the white gaze, what would happen, and this is when it comes to, um, and at the very end of the presentation, I'll, I'll get back to this, but it's really interesting how precisely mediated representation takes place through the white gaze. And when decolonizing the white gaze has to do with this question that Barry Barclay um, uh, asked, which is what happens when the camera, right, when the visualization of this non-racialized, of this racialized person is shifted from the deck, that is from the deck of the colonizers, uh, using the metaphor of the of the of the of the Spanish conquistadors coming into uh, into the American continent. What happens when that camera, when that vision is shifted from the deck where the colonizers are to the shore? where the indigenous people are looking back at the colonizer. Does it matter whether it's on the hands of the officers from the ship, that, that is the colonizers, or is in the hands of the indigenous people, right? And the, and the idea is that, yeah, it matters. And when you change it, right, when you put that camera in, on, uh, in the hands of those, uh, of those indigenous people looking out at the colonizer coming, Self-representation takes place and the white gaze becomes decolonized, right? Becomes decolonized. Okay, so, and here comes the construction of whiteness and I'll tell you why I think it's important and why I'm using whiteness. Um, at one level, I will, I will spend the rest of the lecture looking at whiteness because ethically I'm uncomfortable really exploring in detail, exploring in detail uh, the oppression of racialized uh, persons because I'm not a racialized person. Um, and, and, has, and this is not um, a question of, how can I put it? It's, it's not a question of, of being or not being a racialized person. It's, it's a question of anyone can do it, but I think it, it, in, in the limited amount of time that we have, I, th I think it's, it's much more ethical examining the oppression that stems from my own privilege that is spending the time exploring someone else's oppression. Because through this lens, uh, it, it is the entry point for, for racialized and non-racialized others to explore that, to explore the oppression of racialized persons, right? So again, it's not so much a moral position, although there is, I have to admit that there is something to it in terms of, you know, ethics. It is a question of time and priorities. I think in the little time that I have, a, pri a priority is to examine the oppression that stems from the privilege of whiteness, right? Uh, um, and, and, and obviously whiteness in, in my case is very much, um, uh, has to be, you know, at least, mm, at least it's not normative whiteness in the context of Australia, at least uh, as, an, as an immigrant um, person, right? But, but that's, that's one level. And uh, on the second level, and in a more, more pragmatic level, um, really whiteness is not so much, it's not, it's, it's sometimes rarely studied uh, as, as, the, as a factor of oppression. And, and it's frankly the most visible feature that we find in media representation, right? This is what normally we see on the screen. And at the same time is the primary articulator of this mediated representation. It is the agent through which other color, in quotation marks, spaces are filtered through, right? Or are represented against. So through looking at the construction of whiteness, uh, we can start knowing how racialized, uh, racialized persons can be otherized, right? So it's, it's not a, it's always in a dialectic. It's always in a dialogue. It's just that I'm choosing, uh, to look at the oppression end, as opposed to what I would think would be um, kind of dropping the ball in a way, 
if we just like simple the oppression of others without looking at you know one's own privilege right um and it's easier to look at one's own privilege and i think it's more ethical to look at one's own privilege and how that affects others than the other way around right um and finally also uh precisely because we are in a it's a, it, we need to have a transnational paradigm, right? A transnational approach. Uh, wideness, it's a hegemonic construction that cut across different nations, right? It's much more accessible in a transnational, um, part, from a transnational approach. So that's why wideness plays a, a, a big uh, a big role in this second part of the, of the lecture. So why, uh, let, let's, the, let's start with the definition of whiteness and how whiteness is constructed. And, and I'll use um, here the definition of Fredericks et al, um, which they define whiteness as a social political construction of power. And here, this is very important, right? It's a social political construction of power deployed to circulate meanings in common sense knowledge, right? So the naturalization, uh, of what means to be an identity, right? Uh, social conventions and the social conventions that you have in the nation state and decision-making bodies, the institutions about white possessions of the nation. The nation is possessed by this, uh, by, by this white hegemonic identity. It is omnipresent, right? it's, it's everywhere. It is invisible, which is, this is key, and it's unnamed, and it's unnamed, so you don't see. And that's how, that's why it's really important to look at mediated spaces in which whiteness, and therefore implicitly non-whiteness is represented, yeah? So let's um, have a further look into whiteness, whiteness is, because um, uh, it, it, it will help us um, understand how whiteness works beyond a simple uh beyond the simple conflation of color and race mostly incorporated into um the, the dialogue changed the discourse changed according to the needs of the time so in the middle of the 19th century, when Emerson was writing, when he looked around his New England, there were these very poor people whom he did not consider Saxons. They were Celts, and they were immigrants. They were poor Irish immigrants. These were the famine immigrants. But by the end of the century, those people had children, and those children had gone to school, and they made their way up the economic ladder a little bit. That was one side of it. The other side was the turn of the 20th century brought a wave of new immigrants, people from Southern and Eastern Europe and the Near East. And so the, the former Celts uh, as a separate race got tucked into American whiteness, not as Saxons, but as Nordics. So the 20th century term is Nordics which has to do with Europeans from the northwest of Europe, which includes Ireland. So that was a, a, an um, incorporation of people who had been despised. So the early 20th century saw something that we can only call racism against immigrants, poor immigrants from southern and eastern Europe. And by the time their children and grandchildren were mobilized in the New Deal, in the Second World War, and then allowed to buy homes for white people only in the suburbs after the Second World War, then they become white people. And there's a large sort of passepartout whiteness that includes everybody, and that's the whiteness that we inherit in the 21st century. It's a whiteness that has also been buffeted around a bit. The taxonomists uh, in the 18th century and the 19th century had a lot of trouble with Jews. Uh, were Jews, well, they were pretty much white people, but as we see in the United States, white was not enough uh, to be the American or to be the right kind of American. 
But in, t in taxonomical terms, were Jews Europeans? Well, yes, but. So in the early 20th century, the reigning scientific knowledge was, said that there were three European races, Teutonic, Alpine, and Mediterranean. Now this left out two problem peoples. One was the Lapse, who were in and out and in and out, depending on the, on the particular scheme, and the Jews in and out and in and out, depending on the particular scheme. So it's really the Holocaust and then suburbanization that took away the racial taint. And I use taint because race is not always a taint. Took away the racial taint from Jewishness and left the, um, the quality uh, of uh, Jewish ethnicity. But there's changes have been occurring throughout the, the second half of the 20th century and into the 21st century. So for instance, people who are now the grandparent generation may well feel that they are not completely white or they're white and Jewish or they're mostly Jewish and they don't feel white. Their children probably feel both, uh, maybe more white than Jewish depending on how they were brought up but the grandchildren probably just think of themselves as white people. And if they have one parent who's Jewish and one parent who's something else, especially if it's something else as attractive as Italian, they may well identify as Italian. See, so this is really important, right? Because like, <clears throat> like she said, race can be attained, but it's not always about attained, right? about color. Um, to the point that Celtic, the Irish, um, also in Australia, incidentally, but that's just the Anglo-Saxon Celtic alliance, uh, uh, and it, with it was um, sorry the Anglo-Saxon Celtic schism uh, at the time of the Irish rebellion. I remember the Irish people were sent to Australia um, as convicts who were rising up against the British Empire. That divide, that schism, was subsumed um, uh, by the white Australian, uh, white Australian policy. So that whiteness is not always a pain. It's not always about being presented as white. It has it historically evolved uh, along different um, lines of of racial. And political and social discrimination, and it's an it's in that it's in and it's an spectrum that changes at, at the at, that changes. I'm saying that the 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 visualization of race and color changes throughout history, and and is context dependent. It's context dependent, and in the case of Australia, it's very paradoxical. Right. It's very paradoxical, and I and I and I really encourage you to to read the article "Securing the Borders of English and Whiteness." The other articles, the other part of "Making Where of Selling the White and It's in Mexico," it's also super interesting. But if you're interested in, in Australia, I really encourage you to read this article. And this article start talking about the paradox of Australia as a white nation, the formation of Australia as a white nation, precisely because today Australia, and especially after uh, the so-called multicultural Australia pol policy, after what the white Australia policy, it has uh, what is called a super diversity, high levels of ethnic, cultural, racial, linguistic diversity. However, is de facto constructed and ideologically presented as white and Anglophone, that is English speaking. And this is done implicitly in many different ways at the level of policy. And I'll get a little bit of, into that, um, but again, to know to know a little bit more about this, really read the entire article because in there it really, I don't have time to get into um, the, the, the different formations of Australia as a white Anglo, Anglophone English speaking nation, a de facto one, uh, but, but also in popular culture. And this is what it's really interesting, right? Because in the end, the idea of Australia, the paradox of Australia as a white nation has to do because Australia is imagined as white and 
English speaking. And this imagination is, uh, is, is the stuff of, of mediated representation. How imaginations are constructed is what allows for mediated representations of the dichotomies between white and non-whites take place, right? This is, uh, and this imagination, they just not just happen. It's not that people somehow imagine. They're constructed and reconstructed through media representation, yeah? So these mediated representations of whites, of dividing whites and non-whites, implicitly dividing whites and non-whites, remember, uh, in the in the that in the national body, right? Uh, this take place with media representation, especially through media representations in popular culture and television entertainment, and especially reality TV, is one of those very interesting uh, media spaces uh, where where this division of white versus non-white is most effectively represented because precisely it's um, a mark for a representation, right? It's an, a mark for a representation. We don't think um, television entertainment as a, a form of political representation. We think as entertainment, as not having a message, as, uh, as a non-marked form of representation, right? as opposed to politically marked programming like newscasters uh, or you know, Q&A or any of these political programs uh, or um, they, they or, or, or even film uh, that statedly put uh, a diverse cast, right? They're politically marked. They're um, in political marked representation in which no white representation is intentional, right? So then this intentionality marks them as different, right? Marks them as different, uh, as opposed to this unmarked representation in which naturalize the dichotomy, right? Um, and we're gonna look at um, border, uh, for the security, the, the reality TV show, um, precisely because in there, as Pillar et al. shows, the idea of an Australia hegemonic identity as white and English, that is different from the rest of identities that conform the Australian nation. In that TV show, it's most effectively that dichotomy, that mediated representation, is most effectively naturalized, right? And there is another layer to this, which has to do with racial linguistics, all right? And this racial linguistics has to do not only with the way, uh, it's something that I've already anticipated when, when I'm saying that uh, the Australian hegemonic identity is white and English speaking. So it does two things go together, right? So is the idea that we look like a language and we sound like a race. Right? We look like a language and sound like a race. Like race and language, they go together. And race, color, and language go together. Yeah. Um, I can give you a very simple example. Uh, if you go to New York, and I'm using New York really because the US and Australia, the, the, especially the US is what I know best. If you go to New York, and you go to Harlem and you see a black person, chances are that you're gonna think that person uh, is English speaking without a doubt, that it's, a, that it's an African-American. However, chances are is that person is from Dominican descent in Harlem, right? That it's a Latino, it's Afro-Latino, it's an Afro-Latino, right? That assumption, that assumption of what some looking like a language, something like a race, is racial linguistics. Yeah. Now, if you look at border security, and I'll play just a little clip of that, we're gonna see three different characters. And here is, and this the, the characteristics of the, this these different characters are the features of these different characters are all naturalized, make common sense implicitly, they're never explicit. The officers are all dressed in the same way. They all present as white and they all speak normative English. 
that is in this case Australian English without really a thick accent, right? They're a homogeneous group, and this is signaling homogeneity. Homogeneity is desirable. Looking the same, sounding the same is desirable. Now, passengers are represented as the antagonists of the officers. They are the ones that the officers, the good guys, are controlling, right? They're suspicious, and they're suspicious implicitly due to the different or in not so much embody, their, their, their suspicion is embodied in their ethno-linguistic diversity. They look and they speak like others, which implies in here, in between the lines, too much diversity is problematic, right? Too much diversity. And this is in between the lines, right? That the point of this is this naturalized, this confrontation between others that come to disrupt the homogeneity of our desirable, homogeneous, looking, sounding, the same nation is disrupted by too much diversity, right? And now to top it all off, we have the, miss, the missing narrator, like the voiceover, that in this case belongs to Graham Bowler, which is a you know, uh, middle-aged white actor. He speaks with a normative Australian accent, right? And the role of this narrator, this voiceover, is to reinforce the officer authority. So let's just watch a, uh, just a minute or so of, of border security and just to have a sense of how this looks like. Not only that, you see that in there, they're protecting Australia. Yeah, these people, these good guys are protecting Australia. So. Um, maybe not so important. Tonight on Border Security, this passenger is very nervous and Customs wants to find out why. There's definitely something in, you know, all three tins, but not all the same. I'm sure it's my hey, not hey, there, hey, hey, hey. Can you listen to you me? Don't, don't give me go inside. Tell me don't go inside. Can question. you listen to me? Officers need answers, and they're not getting them from this passenger. Yeah, so you can you can um, guess what happens, right? Like it's I I, I think this dichotomies are very much obvious, right? Now, I'm gonna end this lecture with going back um, to almost the beginning, to the idea when I was talking about how indigenous self-representation challenges whiteness, right? So if, I'm gonna show you a couple of clips um, and, and I want you to reflect precisely on how not just indigenous people are self-represented, but how are they challenging whiteness as a social construct of power from the bottom up? And so I'm gonna play this clip and then I'll play another one. Crazy fun. Now joining me this morning on Wake Up To Yourself is our expert panel. Earlier this week, beloved Aboriginal man, Uncle Stevie in a press conference referred to white people as white the news show, Wake Up To Yourself, that was coming off the back of all of the racist morning TV show shit that was getting put on air. Like, can you believe that you had people advocating for a stolen generation? Well, I know a lot of white people, warm, kind white people. And I say this with a lot of love, but white people are and people got really offended. Maybe having a, an all white panel talking about, let's say the stolen generation and real serious Aboriginal issues um, is offensive to black fellas. The stolen generation not only ruined lives, it took lives, it destroyed communities. It was one of the biggest human rights crimes that our country is only starting to acknowledge and move past. Uh, and so we do a joke of it, where we parody it. Can we see where these people are coming from and, and why they might be hurt or why they might think these thoughts are a little bit racist? Katrina, you have emotions. What do you think? 
I would hate for anyone ever to think I'm racist. Ever. Hmm. Ever. Sure. This is just my opinion. And I'm entitled to my opinion. Absolutely. Mm. Yes, interesting. The age-old question. Are white people c Sometimes offence is needed for people to wake up to themselves. Did not intend to come back and say that. Right, so this is the turning the tables on whiteness, putting the spotlight on whiteness, because whiteness is invisible, it's omnipresent, and it's unnamed. And when this self-representation in here, right, and looking black, what it's doing is not so much saying we're, we need to have diversity of voices, we need to be um, self-represented within the panoply of identities in Australia. No, it's saying, I'm gonna turn the tables on whiteness. I'm gonna do what whiteness does to non-white identities. And, and basically um, show the light of these very destructive dynamics that are very much, they pass in, they're, invis in, they're invisibilized. And that's why they could be very effective when splitting, uh, the 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 Australian imagination into white and non-white, right? And then another layer to that is beyond putting the spotlight on whiteness, is creating at the same time, one at the same time, creating complex representation of non-white identities, right? And comedy is one of the best ways to do this, right? Because you can have, because humor can it's um intrinsically political because you can laugh something you can you can laugh at something and make people laugh at the same time right um, you can be the target uh, and the part of a joke and and you can you can be you can laugh with the joke at the same time right if um, if the joke is complex enough um, so it could be political in desirable and undesirable ways, right? That's the, that's that's why comedy is so uh, complex and it could be so poignant. And in this case, it's used to create a much more complex representation of non-white identities. Right? Excuse me, I, you've parked in my spot. It's a cultural thing. Cultural? No, you see, th this is a disabled parking spot. I had to park all the way over there. Yeah, but I'm Aboriginal, so it doesn't really apply to me. Yeah, but uh, I am disabled. Being Aboriginal in this country can be a disability. I can barely move my legs. But on whose land can you barely move your legs on? Think about it. You stole my parking spot. Ironic, isn't it? No, it's not actually ironic. No, disabled parking spots are for disabled people, not black people. Well, should I just go to the back of the bus then? What are you? A racist? I, I'm disabled. Yeah, you are. Excuse me? You are both in my spot. And I'm a lesbian. I'm really sorry, I'll just move. So sorry. I'll move straight away. Okay, let's. L O L L O L. Right, so, um, yeah, um, I don't think I need any, to add anything else. Um, again, this is what's, what's really needed when it comes to this type of, when challenging whiteness as a as a social construct as a as a hegemonic identity is creating identities outside the he that hegemonic identity challenging it putting the spot uh the spotlight on the construction of whiteness but creating an outside that is layered that is complex and comedy is perfect for that um so in the end the the the, the main objective of, of confronting these mediated representations of media representation is really to question the white English identity hierarchy. And 
In Australia, even if you think about the terminology that is used when it comes to multicultural policy, this white, white English identity, um, hegemonic identity, is enabled through the construction of terms like cult, right? Like cultural and linguistically diverse others, right? Uh, because cultural and linguistically diverse people are otherized and marked as simply non white. Right, because if we think of multicultural people, we are thinking about people who are non-white. So the, again, the division here is implicitly reinforced, and the problem the problem is the division that is reinforced when it comes to multicultural Australia, because white English identity is not included in multicultural Australia, and evidence evidence of that is precisely terms like cult that the fact that you that that the Australian government needs a term like that to mark these to mark these others, right? So the, the re, this representation and self-representation of not whiteness, the ones that we that we have seen before, really aim at breaking with the idea that multicultural, multiracial Australia is for those are, who are not white, are English speaking, right? Uh, is what I call this "Where are you from?" paradigm. Is to break in at the idea that that who's who's usually asking "What are you from?" Right? Think in in the context you don't ask uh, or you ask much less, or at least and with a completely different intention to a white presenting person, you don't ask "What is that person from?" Um, in, or at least you do it in a different context, yeah, or with a different and and, and there are different with different intentions, right? Um, and even though that may sound trivial, banal, maybe fussy, what is not fussy or banal or trivial is precisely these hierarchies that are that might be those examples of the where are you from examples that are simply the symptoms or anecdotes um, of an structure that is this white English hegemonic structure or hierarchy. And in that way, the important is to do away the, with the colonial gaze. Uh, the colonial gaze the, to pass the, pass the camera to those on the shores from those that had on the ship. And that means not to change, not that power changes of hands, but that the gaze is shared equally that the gaze is shared equally, that the gaze is decolonized, decolonized in order to, to leave behind the imposition of this dichotomy of a he hegemonic white English identity and a peripheral on the margins rest. And I'm gonna finish with, um, with, with an extract from, my, from an amazing Q&A episode that talks about Shakespeare. And from Nakia Liu, who who been seeing in the previous uh, sketch sketches and talking precisely about this. Stand. I don't. I'm the only person here on the Q and A website where they have my. Oh, maybe except for you. Sorry, Stan. Um, where on this panel today they said a Gomorrah Torres Strait Islander woman. I'm not ashamed of being Aboriginal, but we're defined mm -hmm. by colonial people, by whiteness, telling us that we're Aboriginal. We don't call, no. you know, white Mr John Bell. Um, <laughs> I can if you like. Thank but you. Um, it's like why... So this idea that we get to pick in and out of these things that define us, it's, I don't think it's necessarily correct. Oh. It gives us way more autonomy than... I, I, I might just finish with you, yeah, Sorry. Um, no, no, th thank you. <laughs> thank sorry. you, Chair. I, I may just speak to you, Paul, just as someone who's, who's a satirist as well. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So with that, the, who gets to define, um, who gets to define uh, the the white and the non-white? That is the that is the point of the case. Who is doing the mediation? That's why mediated representation is so important, because mediated representation gets at the heart of who's doing the mediation, who's doing the representation. And that is what's important in when, when the confrontation of colorism versus uh, whiteness takes place. Okay, so here you have the questions for the tutorial. And with this, um, I, I finished the lecture.